welcome to another Tuesday Tech Talk. Today we have not one but two speakers. Pairing and speaking is fantastic. Do it more often. If you have half an idea, find somebody and maybe together you'll have a whole talk. Uh, this is what happened to Amelia who originally was invited and brought Angela along. Uh, they'll be talking about namespaces and networking and if I understand it right, that is a talk about Linux and how we use it every day. Yeah. Fantastic. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, my name's Amelia, this is Angela, and we're both engineers on the networking team, though this is Angela's last day before she heads off to Dublin for three months. We're gonna miss her. Um, so today we're gonna talk about namespaces and networking. Um, so the agenda is gonna be uh, talking about this Linux training that we went to, or what we learned from it about containers, namespaces, and the networking namespace in particular, and how it relates to our work. Uh, so in January, Angela and I and Kevin, oh, he's not here, whatever, went to a Linux training. Uh, it was a week-long training in Palo Alto, and it was run by Michael Karisk, who is really, really awesome. And he's the maintainer of the man, pa man Pages and has been since 2004. And he's the author of this book, The Linux Programming Interface, that's like 1,600 pages long, but still manages to be super readable. Um, though only about one paragraph of that whole book is on namespaces at all. So, yeah. So we covered um, file I/O, process creation, process cred, C groups, set comp capabilities, and namespaces. And so we came out of that training kind of with two questions. One is, how can we share what we've learned with others? So we're here right now doing that. Um, and the other question was, like, how does this relate to our work? We just kind of learned about this and how it relates to Linux, and we wanted to know how does it relate to us. And you might be wondering, okay, it's great that you figured out how it relates to your work, or our work, but how does it relate to my work? So we're also going to look at how what we cover here not only relates to the work that we do, but how it might relate to the work that you do as well. So do you use containers? To, let's take a brief history into sort of the formation of containers and how containers became really popular. So to do that, we want to start with virtual machines, or VMs. So back in the day, VMs, before containers were really popularized, were sort of the way to go about isolation of different applications, of different processes, of running different things. Um, and so a virtual machine, or a VM, um, each VM has its own operating system, so ONOS. And it's connected to the underlying hardware via a hypervisor, which you can think of sort of as a VM manager. Um, and each virtual machine has its own kernel. And this is really important because not only does it have its own operating system, it has its own kernel. That means complete isolation from other virtual machines running on the same underlying hardware. But, of course, that presents some things in terms of lots of resource usage, um, slow to boot, so on and so forth. And so containers came around. And so what are containers? Um, we can think of containers as consisting of an entire runtime environment. So an application, its dependencies, libraries, binaries, configuration files, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea is that your container should have all the information necessary so that you can port the container from one operating system, one infrastructure, to another. And it should work the same way. So a container abstracts the OS and infrastructure differences away. Um, and another key feature that really distinguishes it in the Linux world is that containers share a kernel. So they don't have their own kernel. So when we can compare virtual machines to containers, we can see here that you know, they're sort of the same in that they have their host hardware, and then we have a host operating system on top, host operating system on top of them. In the virtual machines case, we then have a hypervisor managing VMs. And we can see here each VM can be sort of thought of in this case when comparing VMs to containers as your guest, guest operating system and the application. Whereas on the container side, we have sort of the similar first three, a host hardware, host OS, and although this says Docker image, some container runtime. Um, but then on top of that is just applications. You're not worrying about a guest operating system. You're not worrying about a different kernel. And so what this presents is container benefits in the form of low memory and CPU usage, because you don't have to worry about the guest operating system. It's quick to boot. And it allows a lot more modularity. Um, and so 
how exactly do we get all these benefits though? You might be wondering, you know, I start a container, I run containers, but how do containers actually really work under the hood? Um, and so that leads us into the introduction of namespaces. Great. Um, so a namespace is just a wrapper for some global system resource um, to provide resource isolation. So they allow isolation of processes running on a single kernel, aka containers, what Angela was just talking about. And there's one, two, three, four, seven different namespaces. Um, and I'm just going to run through them all briefly. And so you don't have to use them all together. You could use them individually. You could use just some kind of um, subset of them. Um, but you'll see, you'll start to see a pattern. You'll say, oh, if these came together, I understand how this is what a container is. Um, so a mount namespace gives uh, the different containers or your different namespaces, um, different file systems. Um, UTS um, isolates the user namespace and the group, or the user, num no, sorry, this is um, host name and, sorry, host name and domain names on your computer, on your machine. IPC isolates IPC resources. PID isolates um, the PID numbering. So like each container can have a PID one. Um, network, we're gonna talk a lot more about. Uh, user isolates user and group numbering system. So again, there can be a user with an ID one on each container. Uh, and a C group um, isolates C group. Uh, so at system boot, there's actually just one instance of each namespace, and this is called your initial namespace. So when you have a process, it resides in one namespace per type, so one mount namespace, one user namespace, et cetera, um, and only one. And there's not actually namespaces for everything. So I listed out seven. Those are the only seven that there are. And you can't isolate every single thing that there exists in the kernel. For example, system time. They're all using the same system time. But there was a pull request for a different, for, that, for namespace for system time. And if you're ever curious for what namespace you're in, uh, and you're on a Linux machine, uh, you can go to slash proc slash your PID, task PID, namespace, and if you read link those, you'll actually get these like references to inodes, which might not be that interesting, but they point to some data system, data, some like data somewhere that will can tell you more about your namespace. So we've done a brief overview of the different namespaces, and when you combine certain namespaces together, you can form the isolation you want to create a container. We're now going to dig in a little bit deeper into the network namespace because as members of the networking team, this really directly applies to our work. So the networking namespace makes containers useful from a networking perspective, as you may guess. Um, and the network namespace isolates routes, firewall rules, network devices. Um, so the network namespace in your container is going to be have different sets of these than the host network namespace. So you might be wondering, okay, so if I create a new network namespace for my container, how is traffic actually going to reach my container? Um, and this can be done by using um, something called VETH in conjunction with your network namespace. And so VETH stands for Virtual Ethernet Devices. Um, we often refer to these as VETH pairs because VETH always comes in pairs. So there's two endpoints. Um, and they allow connectivity from the container to the host and beyond, right? Because the host should be able to route to the public internet or to other VMs, so on and so forth. Um, and so the idea is you have a VETH pair and you have one end of the pair in your container namespace and one end of your VETH pair in your host namespace. And so when packets are received on the host namespace VETH end, the packets are immediately transmitted to the other endpoint, which is in the container's network namespace. Uh, and if you're ever curious and want to just mess around with VETH pairs, you can actually just, on Linux, create a pair using the IP link add command, where you give the name for each endpoint of your VETH pair, and um, you'll have one up and running. Um, so routing rules, let's see, so you have the VETH pair. So the VETH pair allows like the host to access, get into the container and the container to talk to the host. Um, and then, so we have those VETH pairs, but we need routing rules to actually get things to that VETH pair. And so there's three types of routing rules that we use. Um, we use IP routing, um, 
address resolution protocol ARP and forwarding database FDB routing rules. Um, and the intricacies of them aren't um, that important, but we'll talk about them and how they relate to us in a little bit. So we've talked about how for the networking namespace, we set up Beth Paris to allow connectivity between your container network namespace and the host network namespace, and we set up routing rules to allow packets to be forwarded to the right Beth pair so that your container will actually receive the traffic. But how does this relate to our work on the Cloud Foundry networking team? So um, we, on the CF networking team, um, have a component named Silk. Um, and Silk is a CNI compatible container networking fabric. Now what exactly does that mean, right? So let's, let's break it down. So CNI stands for Container Networking Interface, and this is an open source specification for how container, run, container creation systems call out to networking plugins to have the networking namespace formed. Um, so Silk is CNI compatible, we abide by the CNI API, and so any um, container creation system could call out to Silk to ask us to set up your networking fabric for the container. Um, and so Silk is used in Cloud Foundry, so every time you push an app, we create a container for your application, and um, as part of the container create, Silk is called to set up the network namespace. So CF apps run in run C containers, and so in particular, as part of the workflow, run C will call out to Silk to set up the network namespace, Silk will return the information that RunC needs, and then RunC will continue on with creating the rest of the namespaces necessary to have the container be created. Um, and so if you're curious, um, you know, we've talked about how you can use different namespaces in conjunction with one another to form a container. For RunC, um, the following namespaces are used in order to implement containers. So they use the PID, UTS, IPC, mount, user, and of course, the network namespace. Um. So if you've ever tried to look at our docs for Silk, you've probably seen this diagram. Um, and this is just showing the data plane of Silk. So um, the larger squares are both like Diego cells, and then the, container, the littler squares are containers where an app would be running. And so here, let's walk through the workflow of like if app B wanted to talk to app C. Um, so in container B, um, it makes the packet with the overlay, it makes the overlay packet with the source and destination IP addresses. It goes out through the uh, VETH pair. It hits, what, here it says virtual router. Those are just our routing rules that we talked about earlier. And it's able to um, exit, or it goes to the VTEP port, it encapsulates. And it's able to make its way with the routing rules um, to the, uh, the other cell where it is decapsulated, it gets just back to the overlay packet again, and it uses the routing rules in that container to then get to the, v the VETH pair for the correct container. So now this is like the diagram of all the three things that we've talked about, the networking namespace, the VETH pairs, and the routing rules come together. So now that you've sort of seen the data flow of how traffic goes from one container to another, when we set it up using Silk, you might be wondering what's going on in the code itself to actually set up the networking namespace. Um, so here's just one example of where we set up the VETH pair as part of Silk. Um, and so some things to note is first, we do this all in the host's namespace. And so inside the host's namespace, we will create a VETH pair using the link add command. Um, and then we'll get the half, the container veth end of the veth pair by calling link by name. And then we'll move the this endpoint because as we noted, we've done this all in the host namespace. So the entire veth pair is in the host namespace. We move the endpoint that we want to be in the containers network namespace there using the link set namespace file descriptor. Um, and so this is just setting up the veth pair um, and all of these functions are just sort of wrappers for system calls under the hood that are calling out to the Linux kernel. So once we have the VETH pair created, then we set up the container. 
And so again, you'll notice here, instead of in the host namespace, we're in the container namespace where we do all of our work. And then we just do, you know, our setting up container stuff. So we rename the link that's renaming the VEV pair. We do basic setups that does some of our routing rules. And then route at all does the IP routing rules. And then just like we set up the container, we do some more host setup. Um, so in the host namespace, we set up some routing rules there and we enable IPv4 forwarding. Okay, and that's how it relates to our work. Questions? John? Yeah, in your diagram, your data plane diagram, how did, um, how did the information about the fact that container C is running on host 2, how does that get into this flow? Like the, the packet's coming from container B, it says I want that this needs to go to container C. So who knows where container C lives? So the question is, um, in this diagram, we have, you know, container B wanting to talk to container C. How do we actually know um, what host container C is on for the traffic? Um, and that's a really great question. So if we look at the diagram here, we have a C to C packet. Um, the original packet that leaves container B is looking at the destination IP as the container IP of container C. Um, and so as part of the um, IP tables and routing rules we set up, um, we know to encapsulate, we have a mapping um, of what containers go to what, map to what um, host. And so we encapsulate the packet um, and we place this overlay packet, the initial packet that's sent out, we encapsulate it into what we call an underlay packet, where the source and destination IPs are the source and destination IPs of the host VMs. Um, and so that way, it's able to leave the source host and then just have the normal um, routing rules take it to the correct destination host. So the question is, um, is there a name resolution, so not by IP address, but by host name, um, I, to clarify, to map from container IP to host IP? Yeah, I'm or? thinking about this as, like from the, as an application developer, mm -hmm. that I know that I want some service that runs on some container somewhere else, some other app that I want to send a call to. Yeah, so... Um, so um, in this diagram here, you can simply call out based on container IP address. Um, but the networking team has recently embarked on a series of work to introduce um, DNS-based service discovery so that container B could query out to container C using um, some host name. So like something like container C .apps internal and then that would be resolved to the container IP of container C and follow that traffic flow. Dirk? I guess when you do containerization, you always get the question, how does this Docker differ from Docker? So how does this, what does Docker do on top of this? Is Docker right, uh, is the co-creator of CNET another that container, right? Cool. Should I don't know. Okay. okay, so the question was, how is this different than Docker? Um, so like Docker, I guess to answer, I don't play with Docker very much. I'm pretty encased in Cloud Foundry land. Um, but I would say like, you know, Docker is one implementation of a container creation system. Run C is another standard for container creation. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question though. Both Cloud Foundry and Docker, you run C on yeah. Docker. Yeah. Docker, you might use some other plugin. Yeah, so I guess to add on to that, like, 
for example, like with Kubernetes, they use a different networking plugin called Flannel under the hood. Um, and that's a different solution. At one point, Cloud Foundry used Flannel as the CNI plugin instead of Silk. Um, so the whole idea is that like, you know, they might be doing different implementations of um, like the networking namespace for containers, but they're swappable. Um, and so they introduce different functionalities, different pros and cons. Yes. Is, uh, is Silk uh, Cloud Foundry specific? Uh, so the question was, is Silk Cloud Foundry specific? Uh, no. Um, so we've built it so that it can be pluggable, like it's built by the CNI spec, so it should be able to be pluggable. We don't know of anyone else using it, and we built it for like our use case, but yeah. yeah. Did you guys get it working on Kubernetes last year? So the question was, have we seen Silk work on any other um, system but Cloud Foundry? And the answer is um, yes. Last year we did um, sort of a hack day where we replaced Flannel with Silk for Kubernetes, and we saw Silk work as the networking plugin um, to set up Kubernetes pods. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah. Yes, sorry. Um, That's okay. uh, is there, was there, what was the motivation to move away from Flannel? No. So the question was, what was the motivation to move away from Flannel? Um, so I think there were several motivations, um, some of which are still relevant, some of which might not be as relevant in today's world. Um, one of the main motivations was that um, for Cloud Foundry, we have everything managed by Bosch, um, and Flannel is highly reliant on etcd. And at the time, we didn't have a great track record of Bosch being able to manage etcd deployments. Um, this has since... this is changing, but um, that was one of the motivations was that um, we weren't able to manage um, the etcd um, cluster that Flannel needed, um, and we weren't confident in that. And so Silk actually uses a MySQL backend to store information about state. Um, another reason was that we wanted to be able to introduce new features, um, you know, with, like, easier. Um, so rather than, you know, if we wanted to add a new feature, like say bandwidth limiting to our CNI plugin, rather than having to make a PR to Flannel, we could just make the change to Silk because we own Silk. Um, this has also since changed. So a recent addition um, to the container networking interface's specification is the ability to chain plugins. So we actually, um, our team just PR'd into the CNI spec um, an example plugin for bandwidth limiting. And so you can now chain plugins. So you can have your main plugin, which sets up all of your networking namespace. And then after that, you can call another plugin, which might set up something like bandwidth limiting. Um, so that's another cool feature of CNI, um, is that you can be chaining things. But those are sort of two of the main motivations on why we decided to build our own plugin. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.